Okay, so we're uh, very happy to have Omid Mahmali, who's uh, going to give his third lecture in his series on Frobenius integrability and Cartan geometries. Thank you. Uh, okay, hello everyone. Let's continue our discussion about our this uh, these topics. We sort of uh, delved into at the end of uh, last lecture. So today we're going to actually I decided to review what we talked about last time, and. Uh, then generalize it to the so-called parabolic quantum contact cone structures and then investigate uh, more what happens in this more general setting. Okay, uh, last time sort of the, we finished by showing how variation of fourth order ODEs are in one point correspondent with uh, two, three, five geometries with a choice of infinitesimal symmetry, transversal infinitesimal symmetry. So to review what we did, because it's very similar and everything gonna uh, look the same once we uh, understand or review uh, this construction. So we start with a scalar fourth order OD. It's a Cartan geometry of uh, this type where B is Borel inside GL2. Uh, so uh, uh, upper triangular matrices two by two. And um, we know that um, these, they define some nice Cartan uh, geometry using a recipe uh, <coughs> prescribed by a uh, number of authors. Um, you see here, Morimoto, uh, Dukov, Komrakov, Chapman, Te. So we're gonna again, remind ourselves what this is uh, in next slide. But before doing that, we just re um, recall that the um, such uh, geometric structures, they have their fundamental invariants, uh, consist of four uh, scalars. We denote them this way. These are the Wilczynskis, and these are, we call them uh, Bryant um, invariants, because if Wilczynski vanish, then they go to a GL2 structure and the solution space. And we also uh, realize that the um, M5, so we are working on um, basically the uh, third jet of a fourth order ODE is defined on the third jet of uh, functions uh, from uh, R, R and R, J3 of R and R. Uh, uh, and uh, these five dimensional manifolds, they have, they're equipped with, um, when um, uh, there's a fourth order ODE, there's a unique, um, um, class of conformal class of the two form, uh, which is uh, almost symplectic, but because we are in an odd dimensional manifold, uh, it has a characteristic. And so there's one uh, degenerate direction and um, that degenerate direction actually, so solution curves are the degenerate direction for this uh, conformal class of two forms that we, we call it a uh, that defines an almost conformally quasi-symplectic structure. So, um, a almost conformally quasi-symplectic structure is called conformally quasi-symplectic if this conformal class of two forms um, has a closed representative, right? And if you write it down using the structure equations, that exactly uh, corresponds to the vanishing of two of these uh, fundamental uh, invariants. Um, <clears throat> now, for the construction, we said, all right, we know there's a closed two form, then pick that, uh, call it row zero. And locally, uh, well, locally we can always do that. And then locally there's a primitive, we call it uh, omega, omega four. And uh, using that primitive, um, we define a product space uh, uh, <clears throat> and uh, define a uh, one form on this product space this way. So pull back this primitive, so this is omega four. Pull back the primitive uh, and pi is the projection from M tilde to M. Pull back the primitive to M tilde and then introduce this differential which corresponds to the coordinate on R. And this uh, is very easy to show that it's, you know, as good as a contact uh, uh, form, but because we are in an even dimensional manifold, six dimensional, it has again a degenerate direction. So it defines a hyperplane distribution 
uh, but uh, the uh, restriction of the uh, of its derivative to that uh, hyperplane distribution has a characteristic because it again corresponds to this quasi symplectic two form downstairs. Um, okay, now we have this new one form on this product space. We pull back the principal bundle we had from uh, for fourth order ODEs and get a nine dimensional principal bundle. And because on this principal bundle now there is a natural scaling action induced on this uh, omega four tilde, right? Because this scaling action acts on the uh, quasi symplectic two form. So it naturally induces a scaling action on this omega four tilde. Therefore, we can lift it to this pullback bundle, to this uh, G tilde, right? We can pull it back. Therefore, uh, the combination of uh, the pullback of the connection form, a psi, so psi tilde is the pullback of psi, where we had here, this psi, and omega tilde, there are nine one forms, and they give an E structure on this pullback principal bundle, G tilde. And it sort of corresponds to a Cartan geometry of P2 and B, where P2 is the contact parabolic in G2, and B is, again, the same Borel uh, in GL2. Now, uh, we recall that the, uh, um, a fourth order ODE uh, is defined by a rank two distribution with growth vector two, three, four, five, which has a splitting into two uh, line forms. And this is you know, almost the same as, well, not all, exactly the same as a, uh, symbol for Cartan geometries of psi G2 and P12 with the difference that it, it's truncated at G minus one. So these are five graded. And if you truncate this last bit, which corresponds to exactly this quasi contact uh, structure, you get a fourth order ODE. So having this in mind, we can use this, this uh, nine dimensional principal bundle that we have and extend it to a G2 P12 geometry to a 15 dimensional uh, principal bundle, but just the usual way of prolonging it. And uh, because it's a regular G2 P12 geometry always defines a 235, descends to a 235 geometry, uh, we, we, we obtain that, um, uh, we obtain a 235 geometry. And this product space we initially defined can be viewed as a cone structure on, a on this five-dimensional manifold and the one-dimensional fibers are the projectivization of the rank two distribution, right? So this is exactly the M tilde we defined. View, look, it can be viewed in here. Okay, and uh, now how do we, now we have here a parabolic geometry and previously we had this ODE geometry. So how do we connect these Cartan connections? The, the basically the main point, the main uh, tool in doing the computation and comparing the connections is that we view this um, <coughs> Lie algebra for a fourth order ODE as a subspace in G2, because we realize that it's, the symbols are exactly the same as uh, these geometries, but truncated at the last bit. So and we have on G2, we always have this natural killing form and we just pull it back to this subspace, right? Then this is exactly the nice uh, and a nice inner product using which we can follow Morimoto Dubrov chapter uh, recipe. Oh my, and uh, yeah. I think, I think you're not pulling back the killing form, but the inner product. Oh, did I say killing form? Sorry. Yeah. Yes. So the inner product, yes, to the um, uh, subspace. And then, um, uh, yeah, this is wrong. Yeah, the inner product that is defined using the killing form. Yes, sorry. Um, um, I mean, can I ask you uh, before yeah. you go through this? I didn't quite understand. So your uh, fourth order of these five uh, dimensional manifold, right? Yes. Yes, but it's. Uh, what's the relation to G2 mod P12? 
So you say you have to truncate, but geometrically, I mean, how, what do you mean you truncate? I mean, you, you don't have any complementary one, uh, uh, one distribution to quotient by. So how do you go from G to mod P122 to this for so the Ah, this is next slide. So the, you're talking about the, com the inverse direction. Yeah, this is gonna be next slide. So far I've shown- yeah, because, how because, because like for ODEs, the, the structure of brackets is just Gursa type, right? So, so yes, there's exactly. one that generates everything. But yes. for G2 mod P12, there's actually two different brackets that, that go to, to one yes, place. It's, exactly. it's, it's a different story, yeah. Okay. Exactly, Good. but we truncated at the last, uh, but you see how we can go from, basically using the quasi-symplectic two form, it's obvious how to start from you know, a fourth order ODE and use this, you take this primitive and this primitive because it's related to this quasi-symplectic form exactly gives you the right symbol, generates this when you when you follow, go to this product space, you get exactly the symbol for a G2P12 geometry. Okay, so this generates one more bracket. Uh, exactly, yes, that's, that's exactly what this uh, quasi-contact form does. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, okay. So using this sort of restriction of the inner product, uh, we follow the recipe of uh, 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 Morimoto and collaborators to uh, define a co-differential operator and define a regular uh, normal Cartan connection. So now this, you knowing this is just the most natural thing when you really want to do the computations and compare these things, this is just, uh, uh, the, the first obvious choice to do, to, to make. And uh, once you do this, uh, you will exactly uh, get uh, what the uh, 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 Cartan connection for this G2P12 geometry looks like. So here I'm just, uh, I, I have removed the pullback uh, because everything is pullback. So th this is, the, these are the one forms for the Cartan connection for G2P12 geometry. And here I'm pulling back the ones that come from downstairs. So almost everywhere. So these are the horizontal one or semi-basic one forms. We have this quasi-contact form and we have these ones. And the only thing that is changed is this one form that corresponds to the sort of characteristic of the two form of the quasi-symplectic two form downstairs. And we only have to modify it by a multiple of the quasi-contact form. And these are the other, so this is sort of Cartan connection uh, when restricted to this uh, uh, princi nine dimensional principal bundle we cooked up previously, right? So we have this 15, uh, 14 dimensional bundle and we have a Cartan connection, then when we restrict it to this nine dimensional, this is how the Cartan connection looks like. Uh, and you see the modification only involves the quasi-contact form. So in particular, we can find the you know, coefficients of the Cartan quartic, and they're exactly given as derivatives of this Wilczynski invariance uh, uh, W0. And this denotes the derivative with respect to the vertical vector field in this vibration. So I denote it by one underline, okay? Um, all right, so now there's just a simple observation before considering different cases is that you would see that this is the uh, uh, conformal uh, uh, metric, conformal structure for two, three, five. And our infinitesimal symmetry here was exactly dual to this uh, quasi-contact form we cooked up. It's basically, uh, we introduced that variable, the differential dt, and the infinitesimal symmetry is exactly d over dt, right? And it's, it's immediate to see that this infinitesimal symmetry is null if the c0 here is zero, because when you put this together and you cook up this metric and use this expression, you would immediately see that if you have this form, then here you would have something that would give you some, some non-zero term involving C0 if you plug in uh, DD omega 4 tilde. So this is sort of vanishing of this uh, uh, scalar of four, fourth order ODE uh, implies that the 235 that you cook up has a null uh, symmetry or non-null symmetry. This corresponds to the vanishing of this invariant. And the vanishing of this omega zero, this W zero means that it, whether it's flat or not. 
So now we can consider we did it like uh, maybe a bit more, but immediately we can say, okay, let's say if C0 is zero, then we have a null symmetry. And moreover, it is three integrable. So this is something we defined previously. There's a, uh, it's foliated by three dimensional uh, submanifolds and it's Carton quartic has Petrov type two, right? And if furthermore, we have both C0 and the second derivative of W zero with respect to these vertical directions here is zero, then we get Carton quartic of type three and the uh, 235 in fact has a holonomy reduction. This basically you will have not, none of these modifications and you immediately get a holonomy reduction. Okay, these are some two interesting cases that, that uh, one obtains. Okay, and uh, so the uh, other direction. I mean, just quick, quick question. Yes. Can, can, you, can you realize that holonomy? Is it sharp? P2. Ah. Uh, so is it, or is it, is the statement that it's no, I think the holonomy is contained in P2? Yeah, I think you can, because you but have, have you this, found any examples? That yeah, so because you have always this um, exactness, you can further reduce GL2 to mm -hmm. SL2. Mm. Right, there's, okay. yeah, you, you basically have another further natural reduction to SL2 uh, uh, semi-direct product with the nil potent. Okay, yeah, I'm asking because I mean the, the, the holonomy, the known holonomies are for two, three, five are very, very restrictive. Very, very, right. Very, yeah, okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, now, uh, so the other way around is not too difficult again. If you have a transversal infinitesimal symmetry V, then that gives you a sort of a reduction from G2, P12 to P2 Borel geometry. So you basically get rid of G plus uh, by only one, uh, so yeah, uh, five uh, 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 dimensions uh, uh, of, uh, uh, five dimensional reduction, and you can choose a quasi contact form such that this is uh, satisfied uh, for, for a choice of when you fix an uh, infinitesimal symmetry. And um, so, ha having an infinitesimal symmetry, that means if you uh, pick a, 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 a vector in the quasi contact distribution, it's Lie bracket. Uh, with uh, the infinitesimal symmetry has to remain contact. So this is zero. In particular, this has to be equal to zero. In other words, uh, the uh, insertion of V to D theta has to be zero. That means the Lie derivative of D theta along V has to be zero. So D theta has to be the pullback of some two form uh, uh, for where M is the leaf space, the five dimensional leaf space of, uh, um, of uh, the infinitesimal symmetry V. And uh, again, it's very easy to see that because of this, that this, uh, this two form is conformally quasi-symplectic, okay? And then we identify the quasi-contact distribution with the tangent space of M, okay? This way, the two distribution upstairs, again, this is related to the symbols being the same up to the last bit, equips the, uh, this leaf space with a quasi conformal symplectic scalar force derivative. So this is kind of quite uh, simple to uh, realize. And uh, there's this last comment uh, uh, towards the end we made that, you know, Fels showed that being quasi-conformally symplectic is uh, equivalent to being variational. So the fourth order would be is a um, Euler Lagrange equation of a second order Lagrangian. And it, this is related to uh, uh, Boris's comment uh, at the end that one can basically follow uh, dubrov zelenko treatment in a paper at the end I cited in 2011. Uh, so they consider scalar ODEs of orders greater than or equal to six 
where, which are variational. And they show their divergence equivalence of the Lagrangians for these ODEs define, well, they are talking about uh, two distributions in higher dimensions, but for our case, one can follow their treatment and show that divergence equivalence of these Lagrangians define two, three, five structures that correspond to, so use this Lagrangian to cook up this Monge equation and other way around, right? And this is again, this uh, clearly these Monge equations have a infinitesimal symmetry. Uh, uh, I mean, yes. Uh, can I ask you uh, about what you wrote? Uh, so, first of all, uh, the Lagrangian in remark should the, should contain y prime? Should it be general? Yes. Yes. Okay. Second question. The next uh, paragraph. Because here you don't have z. That that's the thing. That's you you're missing z in the motion equation, and this z is what gives you, you know, ha not having the z. Gives you yeah, you get uh, integrals there, I understand. Yes, integral but, uh, but but I mean, this general Lagrangian, it's it's yes. not like invariant through the spectral oscillation by y prime. No, 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 no. Just and, and, it has to be non-degenerate with respect to uh, uh, y double. And second, you you this Lagrangian is of order two. The Euler Lagrange equation is of order four. You write O D E of order six. So how? No, 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 no. I say I say four, so. The, no, the, so okay. This one. Dubrov and Zelenko, they treat variational ODs of this order, but in our case, we basically use their treatment for fourth order ODs. So they, they don't, here I meant to say that Dubrov and Zelenko have, they don't deal with this, but in okay. our case, we follow, we can follow their treatment and basically get, extend their result to our setting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Okay, one last thing that this observation would be, again, at the end, uh, we'll talk about it more. There's a nice follow-up of Fels's work by Thomas Ivey, uh, in which he shows that uh, this um, uh, fourth order ODEs, variational fourth order ODEs, define sub their structures on contact threefolds. So here, the fourth order ODE is defined on J3 and on J1, which is a contact manifold, J1 R to R, you have a contact structure. And if this thing is variational here, you get a sub Finsler structure down there. So the solution curve sort of project and there's a sub Finsler structure downstairs on this three dimensional contact manifold. So we will briefly talk about it towards the end if, if, if we have time or not. Uh, uh, one more question for here. So is it like micro local story? So, so this sub yes, yeah. is all, not all in all directions. No, 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 no. This is again for the contact distribution. Like you sometimes even have to take like, yeah, it's completely micro local. Yes. Okay. Well, fine. In the distribution, the rank two distribution. Yeah. Not in all directions. Mm -mm. Not in all directions. Exactly. So even no. of the distribution. Yes. No, exactly. Not even uh -huh. all directions. Yes. Uh, Okay, now we want to generalize. Now that we reviewed this, this basically captures most of, uh, I mean, everything that can be used to, for us to generalize. So in this G2P12 uh, structure, uh, the uh, two main uh, features that we used was this a quasi contact structure on the six manifold. And we had this cone bundle. Okay, we had the five manifold and the uh, a, a cone structure, which was the projectivization of rank two distribution. So the fibers of the cone bundle is one dimensional, such that the fibers are transversal to the characteristic direction of the quasi contact one form and it's split G minus one. These are the two main features that were, were basically allowed us to do what we did. So we want to generalize uh, this by uh, uh, defining parabolic quasi-contact cone structures. And the name exactly suggests what we're looking for. We want K-graded parabolic geometries, non-rigid, uh, such that G minus K is one dimensional, corresponds to quasi-contact structure. And G minus one has a splitting into an abelian subalgebra okay, of co-rank one. So these would be the fibers of the cone bundle, right? and the characteristic of the quasi-contact structure upstairs or in here. 
right? So we have a quasi contact structure. So this is G minus one as what, I, what we would like it to be. So we go through the classification of non-rigid parabolic geometries and we find what they, we, we, we can see what they can be. What are the only choices? So they turn out to be G2, P12, which descend always uh, because we want to have regularity two, three, five geometries. B3, B1, 2, 3, which always descend to a 3, 6 distribution. So this is on a, yeah. There's Bn, P1, 2. So these are so-called causal structures that can either descend, but not necessarily, but might, if something vanishes, gives, gives odd dimensional conformal structures, or they can give on the other branch, give Lie contact structures. And again, causal structures, which corresponds to either can correspond conformal in even dimension or again, the contact geometry. And something that is usually uh, called an XXX geometry. And this again can descend to many interesting geometries, four dimensional conformal, 3D path, five dimensional Legendrian contact. And that's it, that's, that's, that's the list. Um, just one remark in doing this that uh, we heard in Vienna, I talk, a beautiful talk by Boris Dubrov, I think it's a joint paper with Igor Zelenko, they define this bi-graded regularity. So if we used, which is more general than just regularity we're using here. And in that sense, this, for example, for example these two geometries even can, you know, uh, capture, uh, can be more, uh, can be richer. And for instance, uh, in this case, if we follow that regularity, one would expect that if they have an infinitesimal symmetry, then the geometry get downstairs in, is, is something that incorporate, you know, is, is a hybrid version of a fourth order OD plus a GL2 structure. But anyway, we're not discussing that. I mean, I, I don't know really this uh, bi-graded regularity that uh, Dubrov talked about. So I hope soon we'll be able to know more about it. Um, okay, so, um, to study these uh, geometries, uh, we want to have, uh, we basically are interested when there is an infinitesimal symmetry, transversal infinitesimal symmetry. So similar to what we had a fourth order already in G2P12, we want to see uh, what would be the analog for these other cases. So we call them parabolic, almost conformally quasi-symplectic structures and uh, denoted by PACs. Um, it'll become simpler, it's, it's, anyway, an unfortunate name. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, it's, they are defined on odd dimensional manifolds and they have, again, uh, almost conformally quasi-symplectic structure. Um, and their underlying structure is the same as these parabolic quasi-contact structures truncated at the last bit. So in this setting, the structure group, you know, of these packs uh, coincide with that of uh, parabolic quasi-contact structures. And there is a one dimensional prolongation. So G plus is one dimensional. So it's exactly like fourth order ODEs or actually systems of ODEs, they also have this one dimensional prolongation. So, Packs, they are either fourth order ODE under contact equivalence, pairs of third order ODEs. This corresponds to three, six distributions, something that we call orthopath geometries. So they are path geometries where the vertical bundle, so local, a path geometry is locally modeled on something like this. So projectivization of the uh, uh, tangent bundle where the vertical bundles here are you know, is augmented with a conformal class of an inner product. There's a conformal class on each uh, vertical fiber. And for XXS, we have, so these things correspond to all causal structures. This corresponds to three, six, and this corresponds to two, three, five. And here for have XXX, which is quite, um, yeah, um, it can, it's quite uh, complicated, more complicated than other ones. Okay, so for this talk, because we wanna relate it to what we discussed in the first lecture, basically conformal structures in dimension four and three, 
I want to see what corresponds to uh, how can we cook, you know, give examples of integrable conformal structure in dimension four and three. Okay, for this case, we want to this corresponds to orthopath geometries, and um, there are two ways we can study them. Exactly as like in fourth order OD, we can follow Morimoto and collaborators recipe using an inner product and do everything. Or we can um, uh, solve the equivalence problem for these structures by reducing, because we know exactly what they look like. There's an inner product and that allows a reduction of path geometry. So we basically follow this because I find it more geometric to treat it like this way, arising sort of coming down from the path geometry. Um, okay. So, uh, so we do it only in three dimensions. Um, so a path geometry on a three manifold is, it, well, it's a, it's a kind of term, so paths, there's a, you know, uh, they are, uh, we have a, a three, um, you have a four parameter family of paths on a four dimensional, on a three dimensional manifold, which the idea is that along uh, the path geometry on a threefold is that along each direction, uh, you have a unique path. So they naturally live path geometry uh, more correctly lives on a five dimensional manifold. And this five dimensional manifold is locally modeled on the projectivized, projectivized tangent bundle of a three dimensional manifold. So in here you have the uh, two dimensional fibers of the five manifold. So there's a fibration going on. So let's uh, v, let V1 and V2 correspond to uh, vertical uh, directions. And uh, there's a line field that foliates this five manifold. So this corresponds to the paths that arise from the path geometry. They foliate the five manifold and are transversal to the fibers. And there's a multi-contact structure, meaning that um, you take the derivative of uh, uh, the Lie bracket and it, this generates the, the tangent bundle. So in terms of one forms, you can cook up these two Fafian systems for um, <clears throat> whose integral curves correspond to the fibers and the line field, uh, the, the paths, and they satisfy this relation. This is the multi-contact, being multi-contact. Then uh, by lifting to the proper principal bundle, we get a Cartan geometry of this type, and the Cartan connection can be written of this form. Okay. Now we want to reduce this uh, path geometry by uh, <coughs> assigning a uh, an inner conformal class at each vertical fiber. Just one more thing is that the uh, curvature two form of a path geometry can be written this way. These are all two forms. I'm not going to write them down the symmetries and how do they look like. But what I'm going to say is that the harmonic bits correspond to this piece and this piece. So they're written by, uh, uh, can be written as these components. So this is, uh, they're both trace free. Okay, so th this is, um, they're both trace free and trace free when you uh, contract by uh, two indices, any two indices, uh, one up and one down. Okay, now, um, as we define an orthopath geometry is a path geometry augmented with a conformal class of a metric of this form, of, a, of an inner product of this form. So we assume that it has signature PQ where P plus Q is one, two in this case. So we can put it in this way. Um, so this immediately on this, uh, the G zero acts on this inner product and G zero is of this form. But because we want to preserve the conformal class of this, G0 reduces to this. Um, alternatively, uh, one can do differently instead of having a, an inner product on each uh, a fiber. We can actually ask for an inner product on the manifold, a degenerate inner product on S, on the five dimensional S of this form. Okay. Um, this is again equivalent to this. Okay. So this is. Uh, basically the annihilator of the uh, uh, line field plus the fiber. 
And there, there's again a, so this is H tilde. So this is equivalent. You can have either a degenerate bilinear form, a conformal class uh, uh, on the manifold or restricted to the fiber. They both can uh, result in the same thing. Okay. Once you have the reduction, remember this uh, represented the GLN, a part of the part of G0. So you wanted to preserve an inner product so it can be written this way. And because you have now an inner product, you can raise and lower indices. So you have something that is uh, C, uh, you know, taking value in the conformal group. And uh, so it's, it's when you lower the index, it's skew symmetric. And this one, when you lower the index, it's symmetric. So you can write it this way. Um, so this, this should be something also involving, I, I forgot. This should, this should be plus some FAB zero omega zero or something, right? Okay, so because these are, uh, these are cong mod, uh, these are zero cong mod modulo the um, uh, horizontal one forms theta A and omega, theta and omega. <clears throat> okay, now. One can further reduce the structure bundle and basically uh, reduce the entire G plus except one uh, part of it by uh, uh, ask by basically demanding that both F and both, both the, these two uh, you know, um, quantities be trace free with respect to this uh, degenerate, uh, this, this epsilon AB. Okay, if you ask for them to be trace free, that immediately reduces uh, uh, the principal bundle further. Um, and uh, 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 as a byproduct, we also um, have a naturally defined um, <coughs> a two form on, on the manifold, right? And it has a characteristic uh, given uh, by by dual to omega zero, which is exactly, if you remember what we discussed, it generates the path corresponds to the um, uh, the characteristic corresponds to the solution curves of the systems of ODEs that define the original path structure. Okay, so. If we want to have now, if we want this conformal class of two forms have a closed representative, have a symplectic quasi symplectic, uh, uh, has a closed quasi symplectic two form, that implies this these two quantities. Not only they they have to be uh, we are they are trace free, but also they are complete totally symmetric. And this quantity, which is basically the torsion, but lowered with the indices lowered down. The torsion, basically, the which we know already is trace free. It's also symmetric. This is a result of asking uh, the uh, quasi conformally symplectic condition. All right. Now the original uh, Cartan connection is now reduced to this form. So we reduce these two parts, and also G zero. This part is now uh, not no more GLN value or GL two in this case. Um, and we have a um, Cartan geometry of this form, right? So um, um, there's this part, okay, which is a, a GL2, and there's this part, which is O, uh, O11, and this is, this part is uh, R4. So this is the uh, type of the Cartan geometry. And the Borel corresponds to basically this bit. Yes. Um, and now that we basically completely reduced, uh, we have this orthopath geometry and we can see what are the fundamental invariants. It turned out to be a cubic, a symmetric bilinear form, a two form and one scalar. And they're all weighted. Okay. Um, so if you know this sort of the uh, uh, harmonic invariance for a causal structure, uh, they, they uh, the, for a causal structure, the harmonic invariants are a, 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 a trace-free cubic and a trace-free bilinear form. So immediately one expects that this and this would 
be lifted to the harmonic invariance of a causal structure after quasi-contactifying, as, you know, as we described before. But in this case, we want to consider conformal structures that uh, come from this construction. That means we would like this uh, uh, cubic to be zero. We don't want, when this cubic is zero, then we know upstairs the causal structure corresponds to a conformal geometry. Okay, so this is a, another condition we impose on, uh, on orthopath, conformally quasi-symplectic orthopath geometry. So in this particular dimension, it turns out that they're just, again, like in fourth order reviews, there are only four scalars as the fundamental invariance of these structures. And uh, one more thing is that if, for instance, this one vanishes, we know that the uh, original, the, the orthopath geometry is actually a reduction of a three-dimensional projective structure. So the initial path geometry was a projective structure if this one is zero. Okay, yeah. Okay, we just continue exactly as before. Uh, we make this product space, pick a, uh, quasi-symplectic two form in the conformal class. So locally uh, we can do this and therefore find the primitive. The primitive uh, uh, allows one to, you know, define a one form on the product space this way by introducing DT that corresponds to uh, um, R. And uh, using this nine dimensional principal bundle we had, we can uh, pull back and define a 10 dimensional principal bundle on this uh, product space. Uh, on this uh, um, uh, pr new pr principal bundle, there is a natural scaling action um, on this quasi contact, on this quasi contact one form. Therefore, we can lift it to uh, G tilde. Therefore, this quasi contact one form plus the pullback, the pullback of the Carton connection gives an E structure uh, for a Carton geometry on this uh, G tilde, which is of type P2B, where B is again the Borel and P2 is uh, uh, second parabolic in A3. Okay. Um, now, just as in two, three, five geometry, this six dimensional bundle we, uh, we have uh, because we know that everything going to descend to, well, at least we expect, we, uh, to a conformal geometry, this can be uh, viewed as the sky bundle of the conformal structure G written this way, where uh, these um, uh, uh, one forms, uh, so they are after contactifying and then uh, imposing the normality condition uh, upstairs for this, uh, you know, the uh, conformal geometry you get on this product space. So we have to, we pull back, we extend, and then we restrict to this uh, principal bundle. And when you re restrict the Carton connection to this principal bundle, these uh, uh, one forms exactly coincide. They're simply the pullback of whatever you have downstairs. The only difference is here, for this, this, this is the one form that corresponds to the degenerate direction, which is modified by a multiple of uh, the quasi-contact one form. Also, all the other components of the Carton connection are only modified by a coefficient, by a multiple of the quasi-contact one form. So we immediately, like in two, three, five, make the observation that if this Q is equal to zero with respect to this inner product, then this infinitesimal symmetry this should be three, sorry, this is three. So dual to this, uh, this, this is the infinitesimal symmetry that corresponds to, is the dual to the quasi-contact form. So the infinitesimal symmetry would be null with respect to this inner product if this is zero. So we have exactly one of these harmonic in fundamental invariants controls whether the uh, uh, infinitesimal symmetry upstairs is null or non-null. 
Okay, now that we have, again, a, a, a conformal, uh, a, a geometry downstairs and geometry upstairs, we can consider all sorts of uh, possibilities. In particular, we can, let's say, remember we had four invariants, right? These two invariants are exactly one of them, this one, let's say, this one and this one generate the one of them generates the self dual wall curvature, the other one generates the anti self dual wall curvature. So if both are zero, we get a flat conformal structure. And the class of orthopath geometries with this property form, again, everything becomes a, you know, a closed system we use for Benius theorem, show that all such orthogonal path geometries are given by only five constants. Um, the modulus that depends on five constants and um, they actually define, uh, arise from torsion free path geometries, such orthopath geometries. Another condition is put here, this, so remember we had these two Rs, we had uh, N12 and Q, these were the scalars that are fundamental for our geometry. So if this Q is zero, then this is very interesting that uh, the Petrov type of both self to one and anti self to one wall curvature generically are one. So they're that generic Petrov type, but there's an integrable distribution of null self to one and one null anti self to one things. And this is actually answers one question I asked in the first lecture. So here is an example. So it's not really the Goldberg Sachs setting because you have no multiplicity here of the null plane, but it is a principal plane and uh, they give a foliation of the null plane. And uh, their generality is given by four functions of three variables. Um, I, I, sorry, I forgot to say all such or, uh, orthopath geometries when you have quasi uh, symplectic condition depend on five functions of three variables. So here is four functions of three variables. And uh, if you further ask for these two to be zero, then you have, um, they, 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 they imply some conditions on the derivatives of these two invariants. So these two conditions, these actually two conditions are implied. And uh, the conformal structure in this case is in fact three integral. So there's a foliation by three, a, uh, by hypersurfaces. And again, obviously there's a null symmetry and both self dual anti self dual wall curvatures, they have type two, which is type two. And we can find the generality. And in particular, in this case, this one form, uh, it's, uh, it sort of is integrable, right? This, this one form is integrable, which whose, whose integral curves are exactly the uh, uh, foliation by hypersurfaces and sort of resembles the situation in fiber equivalent classes of ODEs, systems of, in this case, pairs of ODEs. But here we have a reduction to O2, uh, SGL, it's not quite, but we'll see in the next time that we really have something like fiber equivalent showing up. Okay, another condition is that you further ask some vanishing of some derivative of, you know, uh, of, of th this case of this quantity that has to be equal. So you ask them to be zero. And in this case, you again get three integrability, null symmetry and Petrov type three and holonomy reduction to P2. Okay, which further can be go down to GL2 can be reduced to SL2 in fact. Okay, find the, and we can find the generality. And now we can set, this is um, also an interesting case is that you set one of the, ask one of the self-dual or anti-self-dual part of the vial curvature to be zero. So in this case, um, the conformal structure is self-dual if only this invariant is zero. So this is an interesting in the setting of, you know, when people consider integrable systems. Um, here you have uh, from quasi-contactification, you have a self-dual conformal structure upstairs. And this is the generality. We immediately notice that no more we have functions of three variables, but functions of two variables. Um, and if we further assume that Q is equal to zero, so the infinitesimal symmetry is null, um, we again 
uh, anyway, this story just goes on and on. You can have fun with this. I kind of have fun with it. That's why I did all these cases. Um, you have no symmetry and some other conditions, maybe we can skip them. And uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, what I wanted to say is, is this remark is that uh, this case uh, where you have upstairs a self dual conformal structure with no symmetry uh, resemble, is exactly the case of Dunashki, uh, study of Dunashki and West, where they consider self dual conformal structures with a null killing, conformal killing. And uh, <clears throat> they say, um, um, actually for them, they realize that everything descends to a surface, right? So in our case, we, one should uh, uh, expect that this uh, orthopath geometry that we have descends to something on a surface, which is sort of implied by the fact that we have here, the counting depends on two variables. And there's a very nice, interesting generalization of Calderbank exactly uh, following Dunaski and West where he dropped the assumption that this is a, an infinitesimal symmetry, only a null vector field. And he again got some uh, interesting results which suggest there what some interesting directions to follow. Again, one other thing I wanted to mention is for, for this class is that this is kind of, I think kind of should be, exactly related to the study of um, by Jones and Todd in which they um, showed that all self-dual conformal structures with a non-null infinitesimal symmetry arise as einstein vile structures plus a solution of generalized monopole equation. Okay, and they give explicit construction how to do this. So in some setting, in some sense, if now we have like a certain orthopath geometries which are conformally uh, uh, quasi-symplectic. So if this has anything to do with being variational, which we're going to discuss uh, soon, uh, that kind of implies, that should imply that the projective structure defined by an einstein wall geometries are in fact variational. And um, they sh should probably correspond to some generalized Randers matrix, but which we, we discussed towards the end when I, say something about, uh, you know, some uh, further uh, direction. Okay, and uh, probably we don't have time to discuss this orthopath geometries. I'm not going to uh, discuss it much because <clears throat> there's one other interesting topic I want to discuss. This, this, this case actually is the most degenerate case, orthopath surface, which, um, um, yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to discuss this, there are only two, uh, the fundamental invariants are only two scalars. And if let's say one of them vanish, uh, if, if this one vanishes, then uh, we actually, we get exactly the uh, uh, geometry that corresponds to fiber equivalence of ODEs, which in particular, when among these conformally quasi-symplectic orthopath geometry and surfaces, they include open Levé equation. And we can again uh, find the local generality. Um, this kind of these structures all are quasi contactified to 3D causal structures, which again are equivalent to contact equivalent classes of third order ODEs. So we exactly follow the same recipe quasi contactify, find the you know, Cartan connection, see the modification only involves one of the um, fundamental scalars. And um, we find the Wunschmann invariant is given by this way. So it's actually derivative of one of the fundamental scalars shows up for the Wunschmann and the Cartan invariant corresponds to this other invariant of this orthopath geometry. If one of them is zero, the infinitesimal symmetry is null. And um, oh, yeah, anyway. Um, uh, so we can consider all different cases, which uh, I don't think is anything surprising. Um, so I'm going to discuss now uh, something that um, has to do with um, this condition of being conformally quasi-symplectic has something to do with being variational. So sort of generalizing 
or extending Fels's result to, uh, the con to, 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 to the setting that we have. And to do this, I used the, the I think the most, um, I think convenient way to, uh, to talk about variationality in our setting is to use something called, something that's not so well known. It's known as uh, Griffith's formalism. So to uh, <clears throat> start, uh, we give the definition uh, of what is a variational problem. So Griffith defines a variational problem as a, um, um, uh, a manifold M with a Fafian system I and a one form phi. Uh, so this, this you know, denotes a variational problem. And it's, this problem is the study of this function, right? Where, where gamma um, here, gamma, is an integral curve of the Fafian system I, and this space, V of I, is the space of the smooth emergence of the integral curves of the Fafian system I into M after fixing an interval A to B. So we need to have like a sort of a, um, fix an interval and then consider all the uh, smooth immersion. So, <clears throat> A variation is defined um, of, of this functional at this uh, integral curve gamma is defined this way, um, which is um, which is basically the infinitesimal change in the in, in the functional with, for a deformation of gamma. So here gamma s basically is a is a compactly supported variation of gamma. So it's an integral curve of I. And it's a, um, it basically is a variation that comes from a variational vector field. So this is like a, a, a section of the normal bundle of gamma. And Griffith calls, um, uh, an, defines euler lagrange equations uh, as the conditions arising from um, uh, this variation being zero for all variational vector fields, right? If that is the case, uh, we call gamma and um, uh, this gamma with this uh, property is called an extremal of the function. So the most natural uh, elementary uh, setting, uh, 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 case is where the Fafian system is trivial, zero. In this case, uh, a, a, a curve is extremal if and only if it is a characteristic characteristic of the two form D of phi, right? If it satisfies this. <clears throat> so um, this, okay, let, first of all, okay, this is a condition, right? So this is a condition for a gamma to be an extremal. Okay, where, so, so the variation of vector field has to satisfy this. And the reason is clear, just put in the de definition of this and uh, you will see that this definition means that uh, uh, basically you can write it as Lie bracket of uh, the integrand is, uh, uh, <coughs> is the integral of the Lie bracket, uh, sorry, of the Lie derivative of the integrand along the variational vector field that corresponds to this variation has to be zero. So this is the lead derivative and its integral has to be zero, right? And remember we fixed an inter interval A to B. Okay, so this is, uh, gives this integral plus this, but we're using, you know, using compactly supported variation. So this is equal to zero. So we are left with this, okay? So that means that the this gives the Euler-Lagrange equations for this uh, uh, variational problem. So this Euler-Lagrange equations uh, are nothing but the so-called Carton system of uh, D phi. Right? This is the Carton system. So when you just uh, find the insertion of all the um, vector field in D of phi, this is uh, called the Carton system and the extremals Basically, the, uh, what corresponds to this uh, Carton system are known as the characteristic curves of D of phi. 
Okay, now this was sort of the easiest case when the Falkian system is trivial. Now, what if it's not trivial, it has no zero rank? So in this case, Griffiths give a recipe to lift this uh, variational problem to certain uh, affine subbundle of the cotangent bundle of M and then view sort of lift this variational problem to a variational problem of this form for this for a one form zeta. Actually, zeta would be the restriction of the uh, of the um, um, of the uh, tautological form and the, in the cotangent bundle to this affine subbundle that Griffiths cooks up here. So you basically start with a variational problem like this, and he gives you a recipe how to lift it to a certain affine subbundle uh, of the cotangent bundle and view it as a variational problem, this as such variational problem for this for a one form zeta. And then he shows that the projections of extremals of this variational problem are always an extremal of this variational problem. However, the converse is not necessarily true. Okay? There are very extremals downstairs that are not, uh, cannot be obtained as projections of extremals upstairs. Now, sort of no, having seen this, these two facts, you immediate, one immediately makes the connection to our setting. That one can ask now, we have, uh, remember that when we have, we're dealing with, we ha always have a, a quasi-symplectic two form, okay? So for these PAX structures, we wanna ask when these characteristic curves that we have in these uh, PAX structures, arises variational problem, arises from a variational problem in the sense of Griffiths. So we want them to be variational for a one form. So that means that two form, so the two form is for all of these are kind of uniquely defined. So the two form has to have a primitive. So it has to be conformally quasi-symplectic, okay? But a more interesting question, so this was kind of, just in the definition, we're using, using this to definition of a variational problem in this setting that Griffiths gives. Um, but a more interesting question to say, what is the most natural non-degenerate variational problem where the Fafian system is non-zero for such geometries, right? So in the case of fourth order ODEs, that's exactly what Ivy does, that he shows that, um, <clears throat> being variational uh, corresponds to having uh, on uh, J1, there's a sub Finzer structure. So if you start with a Lagrangian, second order Lagrangian, it defines a sub Finzer structure on J1. And he also shows that having sort of a classes of path uh, structures that kind of not necessarily arise from a sub Finzer structure, this such families of paths always uh, corresponds to a fourth order ODE if you prolonged twice. So this is basically um, the first few sections in Ivy's paper. And then he goes on to consider when the sub there is in fact sub Riemannian. So this sort of beautifully gives a, um, a <coughs> um, geometric uh, description of what this Griffiths formalism do because because it's quite so what Griffiths is has they he says that we have a variational problem somewhere and then we go to certain bundle where all the extre the extremals can be viewed as characteristics in our setting it's kind of different we have characteristics on a on a bundle we, we view it as a Griffiths variational problem and we want to see okay where does it come from what's the most natural setting that it, it actually corresponds to. And this is what, in this case, it's obvious. For uh, orthopath geometries, so it's again, not too difficult, not, not so difficult to show that. Um, being conformally quasi-symplectic means that the, uh, the paths are geodesics of a pseudo metric. But 
this pseudo things that remember that we prescribe certain degenerate bilinear form, right? Otherwise, we didn't have this. Um, we, 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 th there is something that we we had to prescribe. So this pseudo things structure uh, has is compatible with the prescribed degenerate bilinear form. Okay, with the what what we've prescribed. So this is sort of gives, uh, in, in other words, it gives first order Lagrangians with prescribed vertical Hessians. This is what conformally quasi inflective orthopath geometry uh, corresponds to. And uh, being a pair of third order ODEs, so this is, the, I think, the only part that is we are working on, and it's actually maybe the most interesting case, means that there's a degenerate. Uh, second order Lagrangian. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> and it's, it's what can cook up a degenerate second order Lagrangian and it's extremals, um, um, yeah, uh, so, so, so they, they may uh, be interpreted as Finzlerian analogs of conformal geodesics in three dimensions. Um, uh, okay, there's a second, yeah. So what, what am I saying? To imply that there's a degenerate second order Lagrangian whose extremals when, oh, and, uh, yeah, okay, I see. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, this, is, uh, this is, again, work in progress. And um, for the case of reduced XXX geometry, um, we, the interpretation is unclear. It's kind of, it's quite complicated. I'm not sure how, how to interpret this. Um, okay, so alternatively for all these cases, it'll be interesting to follow exactly Fels's treatment, which is usually called the variational multiplier problem and see um, sort of, see exactly what are the conditions for these things to arise as early Lagrange equations of, of, a, of a Lagrangian. So this is kind of different, completely different philosophy than what Griffith's formalism um, gives. So here's some perspectives and speculations. Um, so we give just one way of generalizing the notion of, you know, um, contactification that Chap and Salach uh, studied uh, by defining this quasi-contactification. And we saw there's a kind of very interesting relation to uh, being variational and sort of having geometries with certain integrability properties, properties, which again, as you know, in connection with what I talked about before that, uh, would uh, uh, give examples of geometries that have some certain uh, uh, Goldberg Zacks like theorems can be developed for them. There's something that we didn't talk about, which is sort of Kerr theorems that is somehow different, that is kind of similar to this case. And it's usually we always have a flat, at least in the classical case, there is a flat background geometries, but, and we have like a, um, so we have curves, but they're not they don't correspond to infinitesimal uh, symmetries, right? They're just curves and in the uh, mean Kalski space uh, in four dimensional conformal structure, they, um, for instance, they're shear free, right? Which again, shear free exactly has something to do with integrability that, you know, you, they all arise from an integrable, from a foliation by two surfaces. So this is kind of uh, very, kind of different but interesting avenue, uh, which, which maybe this, these notions of contactification might help developing uh, relevant care theorems. Um, <clears throat> and we also saw that always in these cases, having null symmetry implies integrability. <clears throat> and we, which uh, again, had, we saw relations, we sort of rederived do nicely tap construction, and we can, you know, kind of, uh, 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 look into possibilities such as Calder bank generalization of, of Dunasty West construction. So, another question related to the previous slide is whether all these variational <coughs> pairs of third row DEs, um, whether they, they really, what's the exact relation to 
um, uh, to conformal geodesics? Do they, for instance, contain all conformal geodesics? Um, so this one has is one has to basically look at what we have and uh, what conformal quasi-symplectic means and uh, uh, compare it with uh, the works of uh, Medvedev uh, um, that probably would give the answer very quickly. Um, another direction is maybe extend dubrov zelenskos result on a variation of, uh, so they have, um, they, <clears throat> As, we, as I said earlier, they work on variational scalar ODs, but one can extend it to variational pairs or systems of ODs and relate it to certain distributions of certain rank. Um, and um, for instance, for pairs, it should have to, probably has to do with um, rank three distributions of some uh, uh, manifold. So again, this is, a, I, I find an interesting direction to, to pursue. And um, the other thing that I talked about uh, uh, as a remark was to relate this einstein valve structure plus generalized monopole equation to these orthopath geometries that we have arising from a self-dual conformal structure. So is there a way to see this relation uh, you know, directly and easily? <clears throat> or perhaps one can even find this uh, pseudo Finzler structure, which should be of Randers type, exactly cook it up from, because it involves a bilinear form and a one form. And for einstein valve structures, there is also this one form that maybe there's a possible to really cook up this Finzer metric rather directly. So um, another, again, very interesting direction is we always uh, consider it going up and then you know consider going to the P1 parabolic, going to conformal two, three, five. Another possibility, especially in the case of causal structures, is to see what happens when you go to the contact uh, <coughs> parabolic. And this is where one might be able to give examples of cone structures with infinitesimal symmetries that arise as uh, sort of this Huang mock construction of cone structures via a variety of minimal rational tangents. Because we know that their construction can never descend to the conformal uh, class. It always uh, descends to the other one, to this P2. And so th there might be some um, ways of uh, giving construction for, for the cone structures they consider, starting from something complex geometric, let's say complex Finzer structures, and then quasi contact defining them. There might be something interesting that can be done. Another thing is related to the third study of a uh, uh, paper of Chap and Salach, in which they study BGG operators for conformally symplectic, parabolic conformally symplectic structures. I think for this, especially for this orthopath geometries or for fourth order ODEs, or you know, even because we have the, the algebras that we have are really similar to the systems of ODEs. There might be something interesting uh, if we want to study BGG operators. And one sort of application of this orthopath geometry uh, might be to show that um, Finzer structures of with whose flat curvature, you know, they have scalar flat curvatures are equivalent. Their path geometry is equivalent to uh, Finzer structures with constant flat curvature. So the, 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 these guys are can be quite nasty, but this constant flat curvature Finzer measures are quite nice. And there is a reason to believe, and it's a, it's a conjecture actually, that maybe the path geometry of equivalent. So, the, uh, and, and this um, would be quite nice to know. And I think this orthopath geometry gives us the right tool to solve this problem. So these are some of the, ref all of the references that uh, uh, we had. So this is the book of Griffiths that I was using. Um, there are follow-ups articles by Bryant and Hisu that are also quite interesting. And uh, this is the paper of uh, Dubrov and Zelenko I talked about. And um, um, I think this is the treatment of ODEs that we basically mainly use in our paper. And uh, yeah, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are there any questions?
Um, I mean, when, when, when you uh, uh, discuss rationality of past structures, like related to, 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 to your class, uh, did you mean parameterized passes or unparameterized? Unparameterized. So does your Lagrangian has some homogeneity properties? Um, uh, well, I guess it, it has, yeah, right. Well, yeah, that's, that's kind of, I mean, it can definitely be scaled by a constant, but that's actually one thing I, yeah. <laughs> um, I, so if, it, if it's not, I it's maybe parameterized actually. Uh, yeah. Mm. What well, the thing is, um, because we are, yeah. So here, here I, this is how I understand it. That you know, we when we work with this um, um, conformally quasi-symplectic two form, that's the one we, you know, that would do the job for us. We are, you know, choosing a a, a representative, right? And um, basically, it's um, that representative. We can scale it by a constant, and um, yeah, in, if we choose this um, distinguished choice of uh, quasi-symplectic two form, that definitely gives a that gives a parametry. Uh, no, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I have to look. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it looks like it may be parameterized actually, but you true check. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, this is something I, we have to address, right? Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions for Omid? Uh, just a general question, Omid. Did you touch some classification of, of homogeneous models in some structures you, you presented or part, part no, classification? No, no, no. I mean, this, yeah. No, 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 uh, none of them. We okay, okay. It might be difficult indeed, yes, but it's high dimension also. Right. Yeah. 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 I absolutely have no idea uh, what uh, what uh, it might be. Yeah. Let me just quick question. Um, can, you, can you just remind me? Um, so when you pass from fourth order ODs to two, three, five, uh, which types can you access? Which two, three, five types can you access? Ah, for the quartet? Yeah. Uh, well, if only assume conformal because symplectic, you can get you get generic type. Um, mm. Then you get yeah, you can have type one, type two, three, and n, and you know uh, zero. But these are all real types, right? You, okay. Uh, you can't you can't get type D, but you can get type N. Like, had, um, have you been uh, able yeah. to ex exhibit a fourth order ODE that realizes a type N? Realizes type N. You said uh, type I, N was accessible. yes, yes, yes. I think I think it it I if I try I can yes, but I haven't done it. Yeah, we okay. Yeah, we have basically no real examples. Uh, it's just explicitly, but I am confident that because the you know we know at least local generality of fourth order ODs that give type N is two functions of two variables. Or if you run mm -hmm. Carton Kähler, mm -hmm. um, but I haven't found like an explicit example. But again, the holonomy statement was like any two, three, five that comes by this process is like, so it's going to be contained in P2, but then you said earlier, I think you could always reduce it to SL2. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah, GL2 can be or, always Or something smaller. Or, yes. Or something or, smaller? Uh, or, yeah. Uh, by the way, I am uh, it, it, So uh, sorry, if I understand, it's SL2 semi direct Heisenberg, right? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's not a. Oh, okay. As of two semi direct uh, highs. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah definitely. Like Sorry, I didn't say that. Two. Yes, 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 yes. It I always see, goes okay. to SL two uh, uh, semi direct product the uh, the near portable. Yes. So eight dimensional. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I think. Um, Joel, yeah. By the way, I am ignorant of the literature. Uh, fourth order ODs, homogeneous ones, under like uh, contact or point transformations, they are classified fully? I don't know. I just don't know. I don't know. Um, 
Maybe not. Uh, like Venice or there might Benny be or... some works. No, 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 uh, I didn't. Uh, you know, old ones. Is that that Pavel talk about this. Pavel did it. No, no, no. Pavel has one no. article that he doesn't touch on classifying any. Okay, he okay. gives a few examples. Oh, okay, okay. He's I, basically uh, the study is to to go consider give examples of torsion free GL two structures. Hmm, okay. No, no. no what I mean, yes. When things descend to uh, the solution space, but 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 uh, uh, dimension can be eight, then it's trivial, right? Six, it's submaximal, it's also classified, and then five, it's left invariant. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's only this. Cases. Yes. Okay, I understand. I understand. So it's a simply homogeneous case, which which is like not yeah. complete. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Very good. Okay. 